you may stand in for now. I just want to welcome our own brother, Sean Griffith. Sean, as you know, is a faithful member of our church. He's our head trustee. He serves on the district. He, and, uh, st sorry, head steward. And he serves on our district. He fills in across the district where we don't have pastors. When we don't see him, he's out on assignment. And we are always happy when he's here to share with us. So just help me welcome Brother Sean Griffith. A blessing, good morning to the church. I almost wonder who she was talking about. It sounded good. <laughs> Praise be to God. He is truly Alpha and Omega. This morning I was listening to take your seats. I was talking to listening to Tony Evans. And he was talking about the purpose of Christmas. And he was looking at Isaiah, and what Isaiah spoke about he was the everlasting father. And he, he put a spin on it. He said, he is eternal. And yet he came in time. He said he was God. And yet man. And I like how he said it. He said because he was man, he could get thirsty. But because he was God, he could walk on water. I was like, wow. It, it was something else to hear. It. As, um, when you hear men of God, uh, you wonder if they have the same Bible as you. You have to sit down and just listen. And he is one of those guys that when you hear them expound the word, you have to go for your Bible and ensure that he has the same Bible that you have. Man, it was amazing. He said, because he was man, he could get hungry. But because he was God, he could feed 5,000. I said, glory to God. He was both man and God. That is the God we serve, the Alpha and Omega. And he's in touch with what we are going through. And... This morning, the passage that we are looking at points to his humanity. And the passage that we are looking at paints a picture of a God that knows about everything that we were going through. I had one slant on this passage, and while we were worshiping, God changed it. And so we are looking at it from a different slant. To God be the glory. Matthew chapter 4. 1 to 11. A very familiar passage of scripture. And we want to examine it today to see the kind of God that we serve. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. And that's a sermon in itself. Jesus was led by the Spirit. Brother Codrington was doing a Bible study on walking in the Spirit. Jesus, having told us to walk in the Spirit, can do no less. Because he has to set the example for us to follow. And therefore, because he was fully man, he is subject to the very things that he's going to ask us to do. And so he was led by the Spirit. And that first verse is very important for the rest of this passage. Because Jesus is walking in in the spirit the spirit is directing him it makes that clear it echoes david in psalms 23 the lord is my shepherd 
And then we can go and we see further in Psalms and it mirrors this. Because when we go further, he says what, he just, what the Spirit led him to do. Into the desert to be tempted by the devil. But the Spirit is only lead us to good things. The Spirit is only lead us to prosperity. The Spirit only leads us away from temptation. But this here Bible is saying that the Spirit led him to the desert to be tempted by the, de the devil. He did not lead him to the desert to look at cactus, to ride a camel. He was led to be tempted by the devil. David says in Psalm 23, after seeing the Lord and his shepherd, he said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and when I looked at it, it dawned on me, David did not go through the valley of the shadow of death. On his own accord, he was following the shepherd. And yet the shepherd led him in a dark place. And yet David could say, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, he recognized it was a shepherd that had taken him to this dark place. And therefore the shepherd was going to protect him and bring him out. Amen. When we are being led by the spirit, the spirit can lead us to some strange places. Hosea was led by the spirit. And the spirit told Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. We would say, no Lord, can't happen. And he pulled her out of the marketplace and he cleaned her up. And she went back. And the spirit that was leading Hosea said to Hosea, go for her and bring her back again. When we are led by the spirit, sometimes expect the unexpected. But one thing the Spirit will do, and this came out on Tuesday night, we were examining Peter. The Spirit will lead us to obedience to Jesus Christ. Which means the Spirit will lead us into righteousness. It may look strange to others looking on, but ultimately it will lead to righteousness. This morning, be led by the Spirit. Don't be afraid. Quite often we are afraid to be led by the Spirit because we are afraid of where the Spirit will lead us. Because quite often the Spirit will cause us to break down those barricades that we have built up. The Spirit will cause you to go and speak to a neighbor that don't like you. When the flesh says, don't speak to her at all. The spirit will say, carry up those by the yams and carry and give to her she hungry. In your flesh, you say she should starve. But the spirit operates in its own rhythm, in its own timing, according to its own agenda. And so the spirit leaves Jesus in the desert to be tempted by the devil. Why? He is man. And he's also the advocate. He's the one that brings intercession before the Father on our behalf. If he is to do that, he must know what we go through on earth. He cannot mediate on our behalf and he doesn't have a clue how it is to be tempted by the devil. He doesn't know. I, if I have never gone without a meal in my life, I cannot understand the young man or young woman that knows what it is to go to sleep hungry. I don't have a clue because my belly is always full. But if I have gone a few days without a meal, when that young man says, boy, the hunger pines have me, I say, boy, you know he in trouble. I know how to feel. And so for Jesus to be able to mediate on our behalf, he has to know what it is to go through the temptation. He has to know what it is to hear the devil buzzing in our ears, saying, do this and do that. 
And so he goes into the desert to be tempted by the devil that he can understand what it is to go through temptation. That is why we can afford to worship him. That is why we can bring our troubles to him because he understands. We sing the song, Jesus knows all about our troubles. Because he does. And the scripture says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. This whole passage is Jesus demonstrating that he is man. We hear about another person that fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. You can answer me, who was this? And he did it twice. And the Jews revere him. And they say that we are following him. And we are following the law given by him. Who is this? Moses. The great Moses that the Jews follow. Jesus can't be less than Moses. Indeed he said greater than Moses is here. So if Moses go far for 40 days and 40 nights. How can the son of man be able to do less? And so he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And because he is fully man, he is hungry. So you can tell Jesus when you're hungry, he know. Most of you only hungry for a couple of days. He's hungry after 40. So he knows. And check what happens. The enemy does not turn up at day one of his fast. He's too strong. Not at day two, still too strong. Not after the first week, still too strong. He turns up after 40 days and 40 nights when he is hungry. I would dare say in Barbados parlance, he starve out. And he turns up. And it's interesting how he approaches him. He doesn't say, my man, you're hungry. Let me bring a little food. He puts him to the test to prove who he is. We live in a world that we are always asked to prove that the God we serve is real. Especially in this modern age. Every time you look around, if you've gone into a calling programs and you hear a particular moderator, the Christian is always put to the test to prove that the God that he serves is real. And everybody is on a quest to show that the God you serve is mocked. I read one someplace on the internet where they say they found in Turkey a manuscript that is older than the Bible and it shows that Jesus Christ did not die. He was taken up to heaven. And when I saw it, I said, you have done nothing to cause me to stop worship Christ. As a matter of fact, you are straying from my faith because the person that brought it was trying to show that Muslims were greater. And I said to myself, well, Muhammad didn't get carried up into heaven, but straight so. But you're telling me that Jesus was. It means he has to be great one way or the other. So I have even more reason to worship him. Because, you see, we are always being tested. Is the God you serve real? And we know why that a question comes. Because the originator of it, he put the same test to God himself. Are you the son of God? If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. This was the test. Not whether he was hungry. It was a proof that he was the son of God. Do a miracle for me now. The Pharisees did it too. I prove you're the son of God. Show me a sign. And Jesus said, you only sign that will give you the sign of Jonah. After three days, this temple can be raised back, broken up and raised back again. Show me that you are the son of God. Sound like an innocent request. Until you recognize who is asking the question. Every piece of advice you get, you are not to take. Because sometimes you have to consider the source. 
That is why David said in Psalms 1, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. There are times you have to consider the source. That is why Abraham, after rescuing the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah offered them all kind of money, said to them, No, you will not walk around and say that you have made me rich. Abraham considered who the blessing was coming from. At times we are taught as long as a man holds out his hand with a few dollars, you take it. No, you got to consider who is bringing the money. It can come back and haunt you. It can seem like a blessing today, but tomorrow is a curse. So you have to consider who is giving the advice. And Jesus understood who it was that was putting him to the test. And so he says to him, using the word, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1 to 3. You can look it up. Because you see, sometimes we rely on just this belly here. And all we are interested in is a belly full. And we lose out on our inheritance. Esau did it. Esau depended on a belly full and lost his birthright. And at times the enemy, when we are dumbing out, the enemy will come to you and say the most important thing is your survival. Jesus says no, the most important thing is living by the word of God. So you're dumbing out and the enemy turns up and says, try a thing. I can help you out. Just do. And God's word says, no, stand on the word of God. Stand on the word that says, I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed beg bread. Stand on the word. That is why David said, I, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And so Jesus reminds the devil of the word of God that he shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil was trying to shake Jesus from his purpose. You have a purpose. Can't let the enemy shift you from it. When that did not work, he tried again. It said, then the devil took him to the holy city. He gone right in the seat of religion. And had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Where this is the holiest of places. And you are the son of God. There are no more place holy than this. Therefore, anything I tell you right now, God to be right. Call you in church. And that is why Paul commended the Bereans. For testing everything that they heard by the word. It ain't matter where it is. If it ain't lined up with God's word, I don't care how pretty the stained glass is in the word of God. You could call it church, you could call it cathedral, you could call it whatever it is. And the word isn't lining up. Something wrong. But the devil takes him right in the holy of those places. And says to him, if you are the son of God, show yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is found basically in Psalms 91. Oh, this was said of Jesus. So the enemy is determined, well, since you bring up the whole Bible thing, and you want to prove that you know a lot of word. I am going to use the word too. You think that you know more word than me? So he pulls up Psalms 91. 
And Jesus answers him appropriately. No problem, saints. That is the game you want to play. I will also use the word. It is also written. Hence the word also. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, Deuteronomy 6, 16, Moses warned the children of Israel about the fact that they had testing God in Exodus 17 when they were thirsty and they started to make noise at Massa. And they crawled against God and Moses. And Moses warned them that they were putting God to the test. And God told Moses, well, strike the rock. Strike the rock. And water came. And yet the place was called Massa and Maribah. Not a place of great miracles. One meaning that there is where the people crawl. And two, where they put God to the test. So yes, you look and we say a great miracle. God didn't see it as a great miracle. God saw it as putting God to the test. In other words, they had sinned. Sometimes we got to watch with grumbling. I'm guilty of it at times. Sometimes we have to watch our grumbling. Sometimes our grumbling isn't just telling God how we feel. Sometimes it's being downright ungrateful. And it is putting God to the test. And the devil is coming again and he is asking God to prove that he is the son of God. Because they say that if you jump off from here, a whole set of angels are going to come and bear you up and you will not even dash your foot against a stone. Prove it. You see that your God great. Here's a man that he can't see. Make him see. Prove it. I heard a lady one time say that the reason why people aren't coming to God is because we are not seeing miracles. And I said to her when she had ranted and raved, I said, when last as you heard someone say the reason they were not going to church is because they didn't see a blind man see again. I said to her, the only time you hear people say they are not going to church, they say, then church, people don't live right. I said to her, that is what will draw people to Christ. When we operate as God wants us to operate, not miracles. But there are those that will say to you, you have to have them. And if I don't see a miracle, then your God is a sham. Coming straight from the devil. If you are the son of God, jump off. Prove yourself. And Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. You know this from the time of creation. Why are you trying it now? It was also a warning too. <laughs> because you already know you shouldn't test the Lord thy God. And yet you're risking it. You ain't frightened. But the devil is a relentless fellow. And he says, no problem, we can come again. I can come again. So we see the devil tempting him in two ways. Survival, his belly, and his ego. Prove yourself. Sometimes we got big egos. We want to prove ourselves to people. If you are confident in who you are in Christ, you don't have to prove yourself. Live for God and let your walk do the talking. You don't have to prove yourself to nobody. So you stand on the calling program and say, the church don't do nothing for nobody. And you know full well that you are helping a whole set of people. But someone says it. So the next time you give Sister Angela a hamper, you call it CBC. Because then it must be shown that the church does something. No, the Bible says your left hand and your right hand. Do I, know I have to, do I have to know what one hand is doing? Let them talk. You don't have to prove yourself to no one. The one that you have to prove yourself to sees when you are giving. So you don't have to call CBC to see that the barrel that you were donating is so full that Sister Deborah could tell you don't bring no more. 
You don't have to call no one for that. Who receives knows and who sees from above knows that you have given. You don't have to prove yourself. So you don't have to walk in ego. So Jesus said he had to prove that he was the son of God and jump off the building. And go again and say, Father. And then the father tell the angels, where are you going? Leave him. He being disobedient. We don't have to prove ourselves. But the enemy is relentless. And he comes again. And he takes him to a high mountain. Make sure he can see good. And shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Now Luke, it's, in Luke's version it says that he also has the part. He said all this has been given to me. I own it. Now Jesus in Psalms 50 I think it is says. I own the cattle on a thousand hill. Yet the devil is saying to God. All this has been given unto me, and I'm going to give it to you. You can imagine somebody trying to give you back your own things. You got some parrots like that, carry away, carry away your limes and then turn them back at you selling them. Yeah, your limes, you know, and he wants to sell you them a dollar bag. Your own limes. But the devil is doing the same thing. The devil is trying to tempt Jesus with what belongs to him. Remember Jesus was fully man. The enemy is basically saying to Jesus, listen man, you are down here. You have become poor. Remember Jesus said, I have become poor that you may become rich. The devil is trying to circumvent what Jesus is on the earth to do. And so he is seeking now to tempt Jesus with the riches that in his mind he has left in heaven. And so he says to him, you're on earth, you're poor, you're destitute, you're hungry. I am going to give you back the riches that you had. In other words, all of your riches will come by me. This is Christmas time, time's tight. They will love to buy something. And then the enemy turns up. Listen man, I can bless you. You don't see God left you out. God has forsaken you. This is Christmas time and you can't buy your hand. I am going to sort you out. Just worship me. Come to me. Do what I say. And I will bless you because the God that you raise in your hand are talking about Alpha Omega. You still poor. You still broke. Come to me and worship. You could as well leave me out. There are those that I can let me speak for myself. Let me speak for no one else. And I've given this testimony before. It was a time that I was dumbing out, and I said, you know what? This church they no work. It's a waste of time. Let me try what the world has to offer. As I told you, that's the time when, when God laughed at me. And told me you weren't always a Christian. And you, didn't have, you weren't getting a girlfriend at the time. So who tell you when you go back, you're going to get one. Because that is what the enemy does. The enemy comes and tries to tempt you with riches. He tries to tempt you with wealth. You want upward mobility. You want the big post. And it doesn't seem to be coming. The enemy comes and says, man, just worship me a little bit. And I can make sure that you make it. You have all the qualifications. You have all the experience. And the financial control the job is coming up. And yet you are not dead in it. And somebody comes and whispers, man, listen, man. Come to a lodge meeting. We can sort you out. There are a lot of young men that are joining the lodges because they want upward mobility. They want to get rise up fast. And so they give their souls to the devil. And the enemy will come to you with the same thing. He went to Jesus with it. And he says to Jesus, I will give you all of these things if you will just bow down and worship. That is an absolute no-no. 
for the child of God. Because Exodus 20, one of the first commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me. So if Jesus dares to bow his head a little bit, even in nodding, he gone against the first commandment of God and says, Jesus says to him, Get the hanks, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. No one else shall we worship. No one else shall we serve. I like that. He is worthy. And he tells the devil, get the hanks. In James 4, verse 7, you hear, if you listen to Sita and, and you hear the children say, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is what Jesus basically said to him. My get away. Get away. You're wasting my time. Get away. There are times we have to tell the devil, get away. Because he was talking about capturing thoughts. And the fact that when those thoughts come, you have to tell those thoughts, get away. We have to many times tell the devil, get away. But too often we entertain the devil and his thought pattern. We start to play around with it. And we try to see if we can Christianize it. And tweak it a little bit. We know it from the devil. So we try, we try to say we could tweak it up a little bit. Maybe the word didn't really mean. Which is what he did with Adam and Eve. Are you sure that that is what God meant? The thought coming from the devil. And instead of dismissing it and telling it deadly hate, we try to Christianize it and we try to score down the scripture and try to see where we can find one that contradicts it in our mind and we try to tweak it a little bit and say, maybe. And we use it for every term. The Lord would understand. Aaron's son thought this Lord would understand too. And the fire burn up them, the offering, and everybody. The Lord did understand that there were offering strange fires. Get the hates. I will serve no other God but the Lord of hosts. And here's the part that is so interesting. It says, then the devil left. When Jesus has shown that he was not giving in, the devil left him. And check what happened. Angels came and attended or ministered to him. In that ministering, more than likely, food was brought, which was the first testing. The same angels that he said that if Jesus jump off will not cause his to dash his foot against his stone, came to Jesus. So he didn't have to jump off nowhere for the angels to come and minister. And certainly having gone to the cross and have risen, he said he sits at the right hand of the Father. He said, all authority has been given unto me, including the kingdoms that the devil was trying to offer him. And it's because Jesus stayed the course. The enemy will always try to get us to circumvent what God has in store for us. Because the truth is, the desert place can be hard. The desert place could be rough. Wind blowing in your face, all kind of sand. Place hot. Tongue dropping down because you're thirsty. The desert can be a hard place. And we don't like hardship. None of us do. Oh my, how much of you are saying hallelujah anyhow? 
None of us don't like hardship. So the desert can be hard and we don't like it. And so the enemy turns up at those moments and tries to get us to circumvent the process. To stop us from going through the fire that is trying to refine us. But if we recognize the purpose for which we are going through the fire, we will steer the course. That is why Paul said, I have finished the race. I have run the course. And here's what he said at the end. And therefore there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But you've got to steer the course. You've got to go through your 40 days and 40 nights. You have to stay in your desert place until the angels come and minister. Don't run from it. Don't run from the desert place. Some of you right now are going through a rough time. And you're ready to say God don't work. And you feel like you were giving up. And the devil is saying to you, done with this. I say to you, be like Jesus. Steer the course. Finish the race. Even if you finish it stumbling. Even if you finish it with a limp. Steer the course. If you finish it by your hands and knees crawling. Steer the course. And the good thing, as we said on Tuesday night, we have a spirit. If you're walking by the spirit, we have a spirit that is going to strengthen us. That when the enemy comes and he says, give up, we have a spirit that comes and whisper in the other ear and say, steer the course. We have a spirit that will remind us of the word and say to us, you know that in my room, the house, there are many mansions. And he puts that before you. And when you are going to give up, he says to you, look at that big house. And you look at the house that you see your friend has from worshiping the enemy. And you say, but God is living a little board and shingle. Lord, they can fall down. And this spirit says, listen, open up your eyes. And see the mansion that I have prepared for you if you will steer the course. That lady's house, that man's house is the bathroom in the house that I got for you. It says nothing. But steer the course. The enemy was trying to derail Jesus. To stop him from going to the cross. To die for you and I. But Jesus had a plan. And Jesus knew his purpose. And therefore he stood on the word. And he stood by the Holy Spirit. And at the end he said, get the hanks. You cannot distract me from my purpose. And he went to the cross. Even in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, if it is possible... Let this cup pass on me. But then he remembered his purpose and he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. He remembered the purpose. Peter came, the enemy will bring some of your loved ones to derail you. Peter came, one of the important three, quote unquote, the inner circle. And when Jesus spoke about the fact that he was going to be crucified, Peter said, ah, oh, no, it can't happen. One let it happen, and Jesus said, My look, daddy ain't see it. See him turn him again. Because he understood who was talking through Peter. And he stayed the course, and he went on the cross, and he bled, and he said, It is finished. And after it was finished, and he had died, and he rose again in power. He ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And all authority was given to him. He has steered the course and the riches that the enemy was trying to give him. He had them and more that he could give to us. If he had given into the enemy, all of us lost. 
None of us have no inheritance. None of us have no blessing. But he stayed the course. And he says to us now. Stay the course. And the same way that I came into my full inheritance. So will you. Don't give up. Don't hear how harsh it may seem. How rough it may seem. Do not give up on God. Worship no other God but the God of heaven. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Worship only Yahweh. I will be who I will be. The I am that I am. He only shall you worship. And for those that have not given your life to Christ. Any inheritance you will have is wrapped up in knowing him as Lord and Savior. It's not wrapped up in the enemy. The enemy don't own anything. He's operating on borrowed time. Somebody left some things with him for a time and he decided they were his. The rightful owner is going to take them back when he returns. So don't believe the lie that the enemy will tell you that he has all of these riches to give to you. He doesn't. Come to the God that truly owns them. Come to the God that died on the cross for you. Come to the God that went through temptation that he understands when you are tempted and he gives you the strength to overcome temptation. Do not wallow in the mud any longer. Come to the real God. He has already shown who he is, the Son of God. All he asks is that you believe him and come. Let us stand. The invitation goes out to all those that have not accepted Jesus. All those that are still listening to the devil buzzing in the ear. If you want to change sides. If you want to come to the winning side. Raise your hand and we will pray with you. If there's anyone here that will say, Lord, I am coming to you. I have walked with that counterfeit man for too long. Now I'm coming to the real man, the real son of God. Raise your hand. We will pray with you. I see that hand. I'm going to ask you to do one bold step. Step from your seat. Step from your seat. And come and we will pray with God. You all should be rejoicing. You're about to get a new sister. Unless you want God for yourself. You should be worshiping. Is there any more? We have one at the altar. Is there any more? I mean God already holding a big party. Oh no. You can come and join. You can come and join. Oh praise be to God. Let us give God some praise. He has snatched one from the burning. He has snatched one from the burning. God rejoicing. If I can imagine God doing a jig right now, another one has come home. We should be rejoicing. Oh, praise be to God. Hallelujah. And to those that have already given their life to Christ, you may be wavering between two opinions. I say to you, make up your mind who you will serve. Don't serve the counterfeit. Make a decision once and for all to serve God. Joshua made a declaration as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Don't be in between two opinions. Make a decision this day who you will serve. Things will be rough. I ain't going to fool you. The psalmist says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. 
He didn't say a little bit. Many. But he made a promise that the Lord will deliver you from them all. Every single one of them. And, and I can tell you something. Even death is a deliverance at times. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Shadrach, Mishan, and Abednego. They said, even if God do not deliver us, we will not bow. Because they said to themselves, death is going to bring us into the presence of Almighty God. So if you're here this morning and you feel to come to the altar and say to God, I am rededicating my life to you. I have been wavering. I have been shifting. I have been doubting. If you are the son of God and this day I have made up my mind that you are and I want to serve you and you want to come and have someone pray with you. Again, the altar is open. Don't be shamed. Quite often we don't want nobody to know that we are not strong like Goliath. Because we want everybody to know that sister so and so are powerful in the Lord. And brother so and so is a colossus in the Lord. And we don't want no one to know that really and truly are struggling. Swallow your pride. And if you need to be here, come. Someone will pray with you. I can I think of, actually we'll sing that song again, you are Alpha and Omega. Because as the Son of God, He is the Alpha and Omega. And as you say it, as you were saying just now, say it as you believe it. As you know it right down in your heart that He is truly the Alpha. An omega and gave him worship.